Oh. Okay. Uh, we are going to begin the second session on uh, cervical spine. And the moderator are Dr. Ricker and Dr. Clavel. Okay, we are going to start the session. Please take a seat. So I was supposed to moderate this session with Dr. Desai. Unfortunately, he is not uh, here today. So we're going to share the moderation of the session with Dr. Pablo Clavel. So I ask the first speaker, Dr. Yip from Hong Kong, for his first talk about the review of the various failures and complications of cervical disc prosthesis. Dr. Yip. Thank you, Dr. Ricard. Um, thank you to the. Uh, GECO faculty for the invitation to come here. It's been an excellent um, talk so far. So um, going to talk about the review of various failures and complications of cervical disc prosthesis. Um, this is the hospital I work at in Hong Kong, so I'm from Hong Kong. So I'm just going to uh, present a few cases and um, the uh, complications I've experienced using cervical disc prosthesis. This is a 36-year-old with um, neck pain, arm pain, numbness, and that's the MRI, so bulging discs at 4, 5, and 5, 6, with some mild cord impingement, but causing symptoms, failed conservative treatment. Um, the MRI is showing some compression at the uh, 4, 5, and uh, 5, 6, the spinal cord. So, um, plain x-ray, foraminal views, and she had two uh, protus C vivos put in. Um, she did well initially, so uh, went back to work within two weeks, and at about six weeks started complaining of neck pain, which I thought was a bit unusual because she was doing very well um, up until then. And, um, yeah, so home next day, and we followed her up. So if you look at the uh, initial x-ray, if you just um, look here, you'll see that there's uh, some residual anterior osteophyte covering the front of the prosthesis. And um, this was her first follow-up x-ray. So we followed it up. And um, if you notice between this, this is, a, this is at about six weeks, the second follow-up. But something was happening to the bone. So the bone was starting to absorb the anterior part of the bone was starting to absorb. And we worry about HO, but this was the exact opposite. Um, there's bone absorption going on. So, um, and she was complaining of a lot of neck pain. Just non it wasn't the same pain as before the surgery, but just non-specific neck pain. And just discomfort and swallowing problems. Just general, general discomfort in the neck region. So, um, I looked... I looked extensively for reasons why she, she could be developing these symptoms, and I, th and I thought, um, so I uh, called uh, Synthes and I asked them, um, you know, does cobalt chrome contain any nickel? Because she told me she was nickel, um, probably allergic to nickel. Um, so I said, in the meantime, I sent her bloods off, and she did come back highly allergic to nickel. Um, and um, eventually, initially they denied that cobalt chrome contained any nickel, but eventually we found that um, it actually is about point five to one percent nickel content in cobalt chrome and um, basically made a diagnosis of potential nickel allergy in, in this patient. So um, I've actually experienced quite a few uh, patients with um, this problem um, using, it's, it seems to be specific to the protist, but I, don't, I didn't see it much with Moby C, but maybe it's to do with the, uh, con it could be the difference between the constrained and unconstrained prosthesis putting more stress on the end plates, so I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, she was re revised to a nickel-free implant, and um, her symptoms disappeared slowly. So um, the interesting thing is when I did the revision, the, uh, I always take down the PLL. So I took it down, and at the revision, the, the whole PLL had actually reformed, so, which I found very interesting because I, I never experienced that, and it wasn't adherent to the Dura either. So very interesting findings during surgery. There was some liquid in there. Um, the osteolysis did actually continue a little bit longer. So even with the revised implant, we did see continued bone absorption. So um, you can see that the uh, AP diameter of the vertebra is significantly shrunk compared to um, its neighbors, especially the middle one. 
that's quite quite an interesting. Um, but her symptoms were fine afterwards, so she went back to teaching. And this is the initial X-ray, just showing the um, continued nickel, absor uh, nickel bone absorption. So maybe a delayed type um, reaction. So um, I, I was using Protus C for about a year with 50 patients, and um, I found three patients of osteolysis. And this, this patient was, uh, was revised. One was revised to a fusion because of actually ex excessive bone loss. There was massive osteolysis. Um, there was no, in we sent off the uh, material for cytology and just showed a lot of um, infl inflammatory cells, neutrophils, but no, no evidence of any infection. So um, he wasn't allergic to nickel, this patient, so I don't know what was going on. May maybe to do with um, polyethylene, which we, can't, we don't have a test for, but something was causing the massive osteolysis. And then one other patient is still under observation as he refuses intervention. So um, did a literature review for um, metal allergies and found these, f these things. So um, uh, there's, uh, th these are the things that can cause osteolysis, various things. So cobalt chrome has been mentioned. Um, polyethylene can also cause osteolysis. Peak can cause it. Um, and uh, there's lots of other things in there in this list. Um, this is a one case report I found after cervical total disc replacement delayed hypersensitive reaction. So there were skin changes in this patient. Um, there was one case report of, um, and, this, and disappeared after removal of the implant. Um, McAfee had this uh, published, and um, they found that um, estimated the metal hypersensitivity in about 25% of total joint replacement patients, which I find actually quite high. And possibly up to half of failed arthroplasty patients may be having this problem. So um, I always ask patients now whether they could be allergic to any sort of metal before um, we put in a metallic prosthesis. So far, I've not seen any titanium allergy, though. Um, this one, so they found that um, in the general population, uh, possibly up to 17% of women and 3% of men are allergic to nickel. Um, this, this paper, but I, um, we, we're, using, we're using cobalt chrome implants. Um, and possibly one to three percent allergic to cobalt and chromium. So um, something, something for thought um, in patients who. Um, so I usually ask them if they wear a metal watch and it's summer and they're sweating. Do they experience a rash on their wrist at all? And um, some people re report that I probably would send their bloods off just beforehand before I I put in a metallic implant in them. Um, so risk of uh, material allergy in any implant surgery of cobalt chrome and uh, would consider using non cobalt chrome implants in these patients. And uh, possibly osteolysis may have a role to play with polyethylene um, cause. So possibly the switch to elastomeric type implants may be helpful because they don't generate any wear debris. Um, the intervertebral disc, this is the other type of um, complication I, I'm, I'm getting quite a lot of. Um, basically, it's just a shock absorber, so it's not a ball and socket design. And we're trying to replicate it in all of our disc replacements. <coughs> so most of the design of prosthesis on the market is actually ball and socket. And all of the FDA approved implants are all ball and socket. So um, apart from the Brian. Um, so um, most implants, uh, ball and socket, um, they don't have shock absorption, no elasticity. They're probably hypermobile. I find them, if you do multi-level, I'm going to sh um, d demonstrate some patients from multi-level. Um, you put them in perfect alignment, and the neck, the cervical spine will go into uh, scoliosis. It could be because I'm actually removing a lot of the unsnet. I do a lot of total, total unsnetectomy um, in some of these patients. And there may be um, a role to play in the uh, constrained versus the unconstrained design. So the unconstrained may be even more mobile, even more hypermobile. Um, so this is a patient with four-level pathology, 48-year-old with neck and arm pain for one to two years, and then shoulder pain for around 10 years. So um, developing motor weakness over the triceps and corresponding numbness over the middle and in index finger. So it's a C7 problem. Uh, their neck is in kyphosis, so posterior procedure is probably out. And um, she's got multiple-level spondylosis. That's the MRI showing three-level cord compression. 
So difficult to approach this from a posterior, so an anterior approach was offered. Um, we could have done a fusion, but I don't like doing fusion, so offered her disc replacement. And there's actually four level pathology, so three levels compressing on the spinal cord and also uh, foraminal stenosis going down to six, seven. So there's actually four levels starting at three, four, down to six, seven, so four level pathology. Um, there's foraminal stenosis present over the uh, left side as well, down to six, seven. This is verified on axial views. So you see the compression at three, four, four, five, everything's compressed. Five, six is mainly foraminal and six, seven is bilateral foraminal. Um, so at surgery, the implants are placed, I, th I think it's pretty, pretty well centered and um, uh, placed uh, post, uh, right up to the PLL. So we've placed these implants quite straight, um, perfectly, as far so as I can tell, pretty well centered. And at two week follow up, um, already started to notice some slight imbalance. So I was a little bit concerned, but probably thought this is just her neck muscles. But then um, uh, repeat, did the MRI at two weeks and everything looked good. So the spinal cord has been well decompressed. Uh, the neural foramina opened up from being previously compressed. And the uh, comparison view of the axials all show improvement. So no, no, no obvious neural compression to cause this. So both foramina opened up at six, seven. And this is two weeks. And then, and then at six week follow up, it started to become even more imbalanced. So keep her under observation. And then by six months, so the whole thing started to look a, a, a bit of a mess um, with um, severe tilting of these implants and she was having neck pain. So I had to do something. So this was eventually revised, um, took, out, took out everything and um, revised it to something like that. So, um, and she's, she's okay now, but um, yeah, this is, this is revised so um, to a more constrained implant. At the time, it was a pro-disc. So other examples of uh, multi-level, this is on table x-ray. So on table looks pretty well balanced. Um, and then at follow-up, we see something like that. So this one's gone into flexion and that's gone into extension. So it's a non-harmonious sort of, this is um, the flexion extension. So this one is flexion. You see extension at this level still. Um, so uh, so um, the implants are probably too mobile, I think, maybe, or maybe I'm just doing my, the soft tissue balancing is not correct. Um, also seeing sometimes we, we get one tilting to the left and one tilting to the right. Um, so it's disharmonious movement, I'd call this. Um, another example is uh, this one. This is from a friend. I didn't perform this surgery, but can see what happens. Um, this has gone in type extension. These have gone neutral, and the movement's just basically at the top implant, and nothing moving below. So um, again, this patient is symptomatic, so he's got neck pain. Um, so um, it, it's hard to predict um, what what the implant will actually do when you do uh, more than one level. Um, I have had successes. This is a patient with um, previous three implants put in, and um, developed adjacent segment disease below. So we put in another implant below, and um, it still seems to be reasonably well aligned. Um, so just a um, mention on the biomechanics, the center of rotation is posterior. That's why I try and get all the implants as far back as possible. Um, try and make sure they're all lined up on the coronal plane. And um, the Constrained versus unconstrained prosthesis. So constrained prosthesis possibly putting more load on facet joints. Uh, unconstrained taking the load off the facet joint, so a mobile core may be, may be useful. But um, there may be too much mobility in the mobile core um, if, you, if you're doing multi-level. Uh, um, it's, it's, uh, no one knows. Um, uh, so the <laughs> this is a picture of a lumbar charité. So it's a bit like balancing ball bearings on top of each other is my best analogy. Sometimes it's quite hard. You put them in and then they'll, they'll, one will go one way and the other one will go the other way. So um, uh, viscoelastic may be an answer. I don't know. I've switched to viscoelastic because of seeing these problems. And so far, I haven't experienced this problem with the viscoelastic implants. So that's quite promising because they do have elasticity. So they do have a sort of spring back to zero mechanism. So this is a 
viscoelastic implant put in, and in the flexion extension, you don't, don't seem to see this. So you, see, you do seem to see that they um, balance a lot better, um, maybe because they have a certain stiffness to them, and we're not, treat, we're not um, putting ball bearings on top of each other. But only longer follow-up will, 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 will know, because I've only used this implant for about a year and a bit. So we'll continue following up these patients. But so far, I haven't experienced this with the viscoelastic type implant. Okay, thank you very much.